And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Still early in the week. Still tired. <laughs> Are you trying to trick your brain into thinking you're excited about Tuesday morning? Because there's a lot of energy there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a tough job. Uh, I'm not even a, I'm not even trying. I mean, why? What's the point? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning to you too. We appreciate you joining us in the brutal hours. All right, let's jump into our first keyword of the day: Biden surprise trip. Surprise visit. So U.S. President Joe Biden has made a surprise visit to Kiev. It is his first visit to Ukraine since Russia invaded almost a year ago. It is Biden's first trip to Ukraine since the war began, and it was shrouded in secrecy until the very last moment. I was quite surprised of how much uh, it was uh, the secrecy was successful because right. it did quite uh, catch a lot of people by surprise. Uh, and it did happen just, uh, as you mentioned, just a few days before this first anniversary of Russia's invasion. And uh, now... Uh, White House officials said planning for the trip had been actually happening for months uh, and that a final decision to actually travel uh, was made on Friday. Um, Biden and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, they met together and visited a memorial to soldiers who died in the nine years since Russia uh, annexed Crimea, for example, and its proxy forces captured parts of the eastern Donbass region. Um, so basically all these uh, military oppressions by Russia over the nine years. Mm. He said President Putin uh, had been dead wrong, in his words, to think Russia could outlast Ukraine and its Western allies. And he also vowed that the US will back Ukraine in its fight against Russia for as long as it takes. He also praised Ukrainians for their heroic fighting. Um, the Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky held what he called Biden's most important visit and thanked him for supporting Kyiv. Now, the New York Times reported that he took a 10-hour train journey from Poland mm. to reach Kiev. So probably um, as part of the plan to keep the trip in uh, in secrecy. Now, he headed back to Poland on Monday, in fact, for a three-day visit there. Um, Biden announced a half a billion dollars worth of new assistance as well, saying the package would include more military uh, equipment and possibly more actually according to the ukrainian president as well uh now he added that the new sanctions would be imposed on moscow later this week as well the u.s will also provide Kiev with a uh, Kiev with an extra 10 million dollars in emergency assistance to keep ukraine's energy infrastructure up and running so mm -hmm. not just military support but also that uh, infrastructure report, uh, support as well. Mm. It seems like we're waiting on uh, President Joe Biden to give a speech in Warsaw at the same time of Vladimir Putin, Russia's leader, is set to give his own speech, uh, mm. not, uh, State of the Nation address over in Moscow. Yeah. All eyes are on that. When we hear more, we're, of course, sharing with our listeners. Let's move on to our second keyword of the day. UNSC meeting. So the UN Security Council has convened an emergency meeting on North Korea's latest ICBM and ballistic missile launches. Uh, unfortunately, the rhetoric, it's a repeated same sort of similar narrative, isn't it? Mm, yeah, it uh, certainly is, unfortunately. Right. Uh, not much has changed and it's not much different to previous UNSC emergency meetings that we've seen before. Uh, now, shortly after Pyongyang test fired these two ballistic missiles, uh, Japan actually requested for the UNSC emergency meeting. During the meeting, the United States called on the UNSC to hold North Korea to account for its recent missile provocations. Uh, South Korea, the US and Japan, as well as many other Western nations, have basically been calling for tougher sanctions uh, for years now on North Korea, especially amid the regime's uh, increasing provocations. But the meeting again ended without uh, any fruitful results. The US side said the council's repeated failures to respond uh, emboldened the North to conduct what it called destabilizing and exploratory launches without fear or consequences. Now, U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, blasted the lack of action um, by Russia and China. She said the Council's lack of action uh, is worse than shameful. Uh, shameful. It is dangerous. Um, now, still, China again opposed taking any action against uh, Pyongyang. It accused the U.S. of actually escalating tension and provoking North Korea with joint military drills with South mm -hmm. Korea, as well as the deployment of um, strategic assets to the Korean Peninsula as well. Now, it was pretty much expected that no uh, further action would be taken at the UNSC because Beijing's foreign ministry before the meeting took place actually said that it is opposed to any further sanctions against 
North Korea. So you mm. can't get any more explicit than that. Now, Russia expressed similar sentiment as well during the meeting, saying Washington's moves were what it called clearly anti-Pyongyang in nature. All right. It seems South Korea, meanwhile, also decided to impose additional independent sanctions on North Korea. Can you tell us the details on South Korea's actions? Right. So where there was lack of uh, kind of action from the UNSC, South Korea unilaterally imposed some punitive measures of its own. The measures target four individuals and five entities, including a South African national and two Singaporean based shipping firms linked to North Korea's development of nuclear weapons and missiles. Those sanctions also include those helping Pyongyang evade sanctions as well. Now, the five institutions have either been involved in dotting maritime sanctions or trading North Korean coal and exporting oil into the regime, all things that are uh, restricted under current sanctions. Uh, the blacklisted individuals and institutions have actually already been sanctioned by the United States as well. Now, the latest designations are, are the fourth round of sanctions mm -hmm. announced under the UN administration. They come just 10 days after sanctions were imposed in response to Pyongyang's illicit cyber activities. And they're also actually the fastest ever uh, sanctions to be levied uh, independently by Seoul on Pyongyang, coming just hours mm -hmm. after the North's uh, latest provocation. But I mean, that is just a reflection of the UN administration's tougher stance on North Korea, right? I mean, it reverberates the same sentiment, still open to dialogue, but tough on its sanctions. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to our third keyword of the day. Labor union crackdown. So President Yoon says he will consider ending government subsidies to labor unions that refuse to open their books and share their accounting, especially. The latest warning again highlights the increasing tensions between the government and these labor unions. Dare I ask, what's the latest? Yeah, so uh, the Yoon administration on. doesn't have just tensions with North Korea to worry about. It also <laughs> has uh, things to worry about with terms of tensions here at home. Uh, he was speaking during a weekly meeting. Uh, to discuss ways to increase labor unions accounting transparency and regulatory reforms he's been touting labor reform as one of his you know one of his key reform pledges uh Yoon was quoted as saying that there is no choice but to take strong actions against denying the rule of laws and refusing to disclose the spending of the government money from the people's taxes and he stressed that the labor union reform starts with the transparency of labor union books. And the labor minister, Lee Jong-sik, uh, told, Jong told reporters that um, it will likely review the tax credit of 15% on union dues as well. Uh, he warned of stern actions as well with no mercy to the 207 labor unions that have yet to submit their accounting books. He gave them two weeks to respond, though. Mm. Uh, and he's warned that if they refuse, he said... The government will conduct a field investigation, and if they refuse that, then he warns of fines mm -hmm. and possibly more measures as well. Who knows? Now, the union government has argued uh, that representatives of Korea's two biggest labor union groups have pocketed roughly 150 billion won in the past five years, not only from the central government, but also local governments as well. Mm. Um, the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, one of the largest uh, unions out there in terms of labor, lashed out at the union's um, latest warning accusing the president of labor repression and it vowed to wage what it called an all-out fight against threats to the union as well. So it seems like the union is taking a tougher stance, the union is not backing down, so these tensions will continue. Uh, and so those two weeks of a grace period of handing in those accounting books possibly will likely um, not be adhered to. All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Bout of pressure. So Korean Airlines' plan to revamp its mileage redemption system has been tentatively postponed. This comes after both consumers and the government have been heavily criticized the firm's plan, stepping up calls for it to be scrapped altogether. It was not really good news because we only began traveling overseas uh, yeah. recently. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, recently. And to be told that your mileage that you saved up, sometimes by spending on credit cards, right, or just saving until a better day, uh, <laughs> would be worth less essentially yeah exactly so of course uh, it was pretty inevitable that it's gonna was gonna face a lot of backlash sure. from consumers and now since the government is also putting pressure on the firm as well uh, Korean Air seems to have bowed to this pressure because it's coming from all sides now Korean Air had planned to change the terms of its uh, what's known as the sky Pass frequent flyer program it planned on 
Redeeming mileage is based on flight distance rather than region for mm. reward flights and upgrades starting at the beginning of April. Now, it was first announced at the end of 2019, but the introduction has been postponed due to the pandemic at first. Uh, this new policy would require long distance travelers to spend more mileage on certain routes. For example, for a one way flight between Inton and New to New York, one of the most popular destinations, the redemption was expected to rise 28.5 percent to 45,000 miles mm. compared to the current 35,000 miles needed for an economy seat. For Hawaii, passengers would need 32,500 from 35,000 miles currently needed for an economy seat as well. So, of course, um, you need more miles, basically. Now, along with the public's backlash, Karina, as I said, uh, has government pressure as well. Transport Minister Wan Yiliong said the airliner was able to maintain itself during the pandemic with the support of the public. Mm. And he added that instead of running kind of what he called a thank you promotion <laughs> for customers, the airline has rather come up with a plan increasing dissatisfaction and kind of <laughs> making an enemy out of uh, what has been uh, someone who should be uh, who they should be grateful to. Now, in a social media post as well, he also lashed out at the mileage reform plan, saying it drastically cut the value of mileages hard won by customers. And mm. a lot of people might want to uh, wanted to have used these mileages during the pandemic as well. And they're kind of mm. saved up, hopefully, for when mm. the skies reopen. And now they're kind of, mm. you know, facing this kind of. Um, uh, I can't think of the English word for all of a sudden, but uh, <laughs> unwelcome news, basically. Of, uh, uh, I was curious, I was going to say, I was wondering what the word in English is for that, but uh, yeah. You know, it, uh, it, you it is it. quite an uncomfortable thought. And, and the truth is, Korean Air and any of these airlines does hold that much power, don't they? I mean, yeah. they are allowed to technically lessen the value of each mileage point. Now, the yeah. backlash had made them yield to the pressure, but it's also Korean Air's a perspective that there's too much mileage stored during the pandemic so uh, that's yeah. their reasoning is that fair and the, well the customers have spoken absolutely not yeah exactly yeah. i mean yeah, uh, you can't have the best of both worlds and uh, customers uh, don't like change and if it's something that they're not benefiting from then of course there's going to be an outcry over it it doesn't help that the economy is tough and plane tickets yeah, are expensive well. too yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> all right let's move on to our final keyword of the day KF-21 flight successful. So a two-seat prototype of South Korea's homegrown KF-21 fighter jet completed its first test flight successfully. Can you tell us the details? Yes, this is the fourth KF-21 prototype. It took off from Satton uh, down in South Gyeongsangdo province at uh, just, un uh, just before 11.30 a.m. yesterday. It completed a 34-minute flight. Now, there are six prototypes of the KF-21. Three prototypes tested earlier were all single uh, seaters. Unlike them, the fourth prototype is a two-seat variant mm. and will be used mainly for training new pilots. Um, and in Monday's test, only one pilot was aboard the prototype as the initial flight was intended only to check the model's safety. Uh, the Defense Acquisition Program Administration uh, that's running the whole project plans to start conducting flights for two more prototypes in the first half of the year. That's part of a plan to conduct some 2,000 test flights in total by February 2026, by which they hope to start mass production. Mm. Thank you very much, Adam, for a thorough coverage. As always, have a safe day. We'll see you tomorrow. You too. Stay safe. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.